Hi everybody, my name's Antoinette, this is Board Game Inquisition and welcome to August Monthly Roundup. Hi folks and thank you for joining me for another monthly roundup video where I'm going to talk about the changes to my board game collection for the month of August 2020 um, and this will cover new games that have arrived, games I've traded for, things I've been playing and of course as always I invite you to play along at home. I'm always really curious to hear what everyone else has been playing lusting after, looking into, maybe even disliking. Um, I think the more information we can spread about our games, kind of the better, right? Um, so as always, this video is kind of free and easy. I want to call it that, but it feels as serious as many other videos. Um, but this is the one where I get to sit down and have a talk to you about some of my favorite things, which are, of course, board games. Um, so I'm going to launch right into the new acquisitions for this month. Um, and we're going to start with, let me check my list because I was only uncertain. Okay, this is interesting actually because this month I've got a lot of what I would call like bargain games. As in games that are way cheaper than they normally should be. Um, I don't know about you guys but I love a good bargain and I'm forever watching for one. And great places to look for bargains are of course kind of Facebook groups where they have secondhand games for sale and for trade. Um, but you really got to be very quick with those because they're usually time sensitive. So it's like first come, first serve. So you kind of have to be watching um, and I'm very fortunate that I have the ability to keep my eye on these kind of things during the day. The other place um, that people post about kind of good bargains are actually on Board Game Geek. There's a number of sales sections there or threads um, for kind of good value things or stuff that's especially on sale. Um, and that's how we came across this particular game because that was a very long winded way to say I got a very cheap copy of The Pillars of the Earth. Um, this is from Cosmos Games. Um, this is a game that is also a book. I've not read the book. If you've read the book, let's hear about it. Um, but the game is one of those older ones that I found people talked about a lot and seem to have quite a bit of respect for. So when we saw it really, really cheap on, you're not gonna believe this, Woucher of all places. Um, anybody who's in the UK, maybe in Ireland, will understand why this is really hilarious because Voucher is the kind of site where, you know, you get vouchers or things for your home or I don't know, definitely not board games, I think would be the idea. Um, so imagine my shock when indeed they did have a board game there and it actually showed up. Um, so yeah, so Pillars of the Earth, it's a worker placement game. Um, it's got an unusual thing to it. Um, the aim of the game is to build a cathedral over um, a certain number of turns. I kind of want to say six. Um, and the game is set over, you know, hundreds of years as you build this cathedral and you acquire resources to help build it. Um, it's not a, I don't know, I didn't particularly enjoy the game, but I've started to realize that maybe I just don't like worker placement games anymore, or at least not kind of straightforward ones. I seem to like worker placements when it's used in conjunction with other things. Um, but this game is very much straightforward worker placement. Um, the interesting thing about it though, is that you put your workers out on the board where you'd like them to go, and then you get the opportunity to bid um, to decide if you want to pay to go there before everyone else does. So it's a very interesting way of kind of fighting for your spot, I suppose. I thought that was the most interesting part of it. And of course it comes with a wooden cathedral that you build piece by piece, which I, I kind of liked. But overall I just, I didn't find it particularly inspiring <laughs> um, or that exciting, but I, I could see why people would enjoy it. I think, like I said, I think I'm just falling out of love with those type of games in general, but a very, very interesting one nonetheless. I don't think I've ever seen a mechanic quite like that worker placement one, it's very unusual. So yeah, so that was the Pillars of the Earth. So that was the first one. So the second game, doo -doo -doo -doo, resort to my, uh, my trusty list. Okay, so this one, um, I suppose I have to thank Shut Up and Sit Down for this, really, because a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, I was listening to the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast and they talked about this game and they described it as kind of very, very complicated um, and boring, I think might have been the words that were used. And this is Lignum from Capstone Games. Um, and you know what, I, I like a challenge. If somebody says to me, you know, oh, this game is kind of really difficult to understand. I'm like, really, how difficult? Come on, 
bring it on let me try it and here in our house we have a tendency to be able to deal also with terrible rule books um and you know i don't know i guess i guess it's some kind of gift or maybe we're playing things wrong all along and we just don't know but stuff like that doesn't seem to bother us the way maybe it does other people and so lignum i'd heard yes was complicated it was boring and then after I got a copy, um, everyone was saying that, oh, it's got a terrible rule book. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. And then, was, and then I went, nah, you know, we'll manage this, we'll do it. Um, so Lignum is a game about wood production. Yes, um, not that type of wood. So what happens in it is, is that there are various stages wood is processed through and you control them on the board worker placement style except all the positions on the board are numbered from one to 22, I think it is, or 20, depending which side of the board you're playing with. And you decide how far you want to go on this board to perform an action. So let's say the first stop, you know, might pick you up a wagon for transporting your stuff. The next stop might, you know, get you guys to cut down your trees, you know, that kind of thing. So you decide which is more important to you, where you want to go first. Um, and it makes for a really interesting kind of, it's not, I don't want to call it worker placement, I kind of want to call it action selection. Um, but at two players, we find it really, really interesting to kind of battle our way around the board to get to all these positions. And then once you have marked everything you're doing, got all your workers, then you go through the process of actually turning your wood into um, lumber and deciding whether to sell it or hand it in for quests. But it's a very exacting and very punishing game um, in the sense that if you've forgotten some sort of step on your way around, so for instance, like, like here's the steps, you chop down the wood, check. Then you have to transport the wood, right? But you can't just transport the wood, you need stuff with a guy to transport the wood. Then once you get it to the other end, you need a guy with a saw to break it into lumber right um and then you have to sell it and and you can also age and dry your wood so you can see how this goes but if you didn't buy enough meeples at one step to do something you just can't do it it's quite ruthless and it's it's a game also where you end up taking loans <laughs> I normally hate taking loans. For some reason, I didn't mind it in this. I don't I don't know why, but um, overall, it was a really, really fun game. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to think I could teach it somebody to, to, to somebody now that I've played it. Um, the rule book, I don't know, we didn't find it. We didn't find it that bad. Other people have had issues. I understand, you know, and also there's only two of us playing. So, you know, it's a lot easier for two of us to figure out how to play than I think it is for a group of players. But overall, I was really, really surprised by Lignum. Absolutely, outstandingly surprised. Um, and it was so, 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 so good. And you'll be interested to note that um, the board game designer gave me a tip on how to win at Lignum. And he said, you just have to play slightly better than your opponent. <laughs> I was hoping for some real insight to help me win. I didn't do particularly well, but I had a lot of fun on the journey and I stayed up way past my bedtime trying to finish our first game of Lignum. Um, so yeah, I would, I really enjoy, enjoyed it. As far as dry euros go, oh, it's up there. It, it was super good. So it was nice to find something good this month because um, I'm being very careful with our collection at the moment where I, I don't want to keep games that I don't think we're going to play often, right? And I'm being quite ruthless about it because it's so easy to just keep your games and have them pile up and never play with any of them. And I don't want my collection to be like that. I want my collection to be, I could pick any of these games and I would happily play them, not under specific circumstances or things like that, you know. So I've had a lot of games coming in and a lot of games going out and they're the games going out are good games. There's no question about it. It's just the more you kind of curate your collection, the more competition there is for space, isn't it? So it was really nice to find something that we were like, this is a definite keeper because it's been a bit of a while. Right, so the last um, two things on the purchase list came together and this was yet another bargain basement kind of hunt. Um, and Osprey Games were having a sale. Normally, like, how many of their games would I even be interested in? I don't know. But they did have one Reiner Knizia game that I thought looked kind of interesting and it was a fiver. So I was like, you can't go wrong with a game for a fiver, right? And I own very few titles from Reiner Knizia and this was Sakura. 
Ding, 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 ding. Um, yeah, so how many games are named Sakura? Like 40, I don't know, <laughs> a lot. Um, but this is a beautifully kind of produced game. It comes in this lovely box with an insert. Don't get me started on the cards. The cards are horrendous, absolutely out of this world, terrible. You know the type of cards that stick together when you play them? And if you put them in your hand, they all just clump into one. Yeah, those, the cards are awful. But the game itself was surprisingly fun. Um, as you may or may not have noticed, um, I'm really into my heavier games and I okay you know yeah I like my small games from time to time but it's rare you know what I mean they're, they're not the, the first port of call in our house so for these small games to kind of show up I was like oh okay well we'll see what happens so we played Sakura um, and this is the game about following the emperor through the garden and it is essentially a, a game of getting yourself um as close to the emperor as possible so it's kind of like a line reordering game and on your turn you play a card to essentially reorder the line they all have an initiative number to determine which order they go in um and it reminds me a lot of something like robo rally where you're trying to program where you're ending up but you're not really sure if it's going to work out the way you'd like um and we really really loved it which is so bizarre because it's just this little game where you play one card um, a turn and try reorder the line but for some reason it's really really captivating and um, not two players you play with a dummy player and i kind of like the guy i i kind of i hate when he makes stupid mistakes like walking into the emperor because if you walk into the emperor you get put back three spaces no go um and i just i you know i i like that he plays with us i i'm, I'm cool with this because his card comes out at random from the deck of cards what he does and sometimes it's clever sometimes it's not he almost beat us in the last game we played but there's something very addictive and very fun about this little game that I was totally um, blindsided by. I like a, we we started playing it yesterday for the first time. We played it four or five times already. It's a quick little thing, um, but it's very very chill, very fun, and it's random, but it doesn't feel too random because I don't really like random. But for some reason, I I rather enjoyed this. So this was a steal, people. If it's still available for this price, I totally recommend you check it out. It was really really good. So the final game on our list is Samurai Gardeners. Yes, I would call Samurai Gardeners. And this is also from Osprey Games. And the reason we own this is because if you bought another game with Sakura, shipping was free. So this is the game my husband chose. Um, a Samurai Gardener is a game about, well, making patterns with your cards. So you have a handful of cards well you, you choose a card each turn and you place it on top of your other cards to try and connect similar spaces together so you want to connect you know all the water tiles together or all the path tiles together um, so that you can score points and the more of them you can connect together the more points you score up until a point when then there's too much um, so yeah, it's an overlapping card kind of thing. Um, yet again, I had problems with the card quality issue in this. All of our cards arrived bent. It was very difficult to actually put them in and out and under each other as the game described. I didn't like some of the rules in the game either. I thought it was very strange. You can only place your cards like this way up, not this way up. I can't remember which is horizontal and vertical, so we'll do hands. Um, and I, I didn't I didn't appreciate that. And the time I, I was playing it, I really just felt like um, walking in Provence from Emperor S4 just did a better job of the, the same kind of game. Um, this overlapping cards to match things up. Um, so, you know, yeah, it was a letdown, but at least the other half of this purchase was a let up, as they say. So yeah, so that's been everything we've bought this month. What about yourselves? Have you been picking up games? Um, there's been a couple of new releases this month as well. So maybe you've got some of those. Or have you been backing anything on Kickstarter? Because you may or may or not have noticed that there is a Kickstarter for the Stefan Feld collection. As you all know, I'm a very big fan and I was very excited about this, where you could get basically what are reprints, but reimaginings of some of Stefan Feld's out of print games, mostly Bruges and Macau. And so I was super excited about this to hear all about it. And then I heard there was going to be a deluxe version of the new games. And I was like, I never do deluxe. I never go there. But 
but God, it's Stefan Fell, so I kind of want to go there. Um, and then they showed how much it cost, and I was horrified. Um, so basically, it's like 100 bucks for each deluxe version. You don't get any um, discount for buying both of them now, and there's going to be more in the series. And so I was just like, God, that's an awful lot of money to pay. And the deluxe stuff, I don't know. I don't think it looks all that deluxe to me. Um, I don't think it looks special enough to merit that much money for it. And then I saw what the re-implementation of Bruges, Bruges, that they weren't going to have any text on the cards. Um, any of you who've played it before know that the cards all have their own text and they interact with each other and they do cool things. And I was really disappointed to see that. And I was like, I think I'd just rather play with my own copy than buy this new version. So we've elected against buying the whole, you know, shebang of deluxeness. It, it was just too much money um, and kind of invested it instead in some things here so I got a new tripod for my camera picture somewhere um, and it's it's really impressive looking so I hope that will give for kind of smoother intro videos to my other videos which would be great because my own tripod was kind of on its last legs so I guess you know we didn't get as much stuff on felt as we would have liked but got something else I suppose yeah you know I think Kickstarter is it's oh you want a bit when it's something you really want you really want to be a part of it but there was a part of my brain that was like you just have to be sensible sure you love the Stefan Fell games but it's a lot of books um so yeah have you been checking out that campaign or have you been looking at anything else exciting on Kickstarter I know there's been a bunch of really cool stuff go up lately and I'm not really a Kickstarter person normally um but you know when it's somebody you you, you know and love you kind of want to get involved yeah but I'd, I'd love to hear what you've been looking at um, okay, so I'll move very quickly on to the second section because it's very much related to the first section, which is trading. Um, as always, I ask, have you have you managed any trades? We've managed two this month um, and they've both been really, really interesting. Um, and you'll probably be horrified by the first trade. Um, but you've got to remember, my philosophy is I don't worry so much about the value of my games. I worry more about having games that I want to play. Um, and stuff. So the first trade that went through was the Alhambra Big Box, which I didn't know before. Woohoo! Heard good things about Alhambra. And I traded away our copy of Tainted Grail. Um, so I think I talked about Tainted Grail before. We played the, the first episode. It's a kind of a storytelling adventure game where you reveal parts of the map as you go along. Has some very cool miniatures, um, lots of kind of reading and storytelling and stuff. Um, and it's so not us. Um, we kind of hoped, I really hoped it would be when we managed to trade for it some time ago now. Um, but we just never were interested in getting back to it. And we're not the people who want to sit down and read the story. It's kind of lame actually when you think about it considering we do role play and stuff like that um you know um but not when it comes to games we don't want to sit down and go oh what's going to happen next i think it's just not us so that's why i the grail didn't work out i'm sure it's an absolutely fine game it was just too much reading um and so we have a copy now of alhambra so yeah the big box it's a big box. It's huge. Um, you might have seen pictures. You might have seen pictures of it. Um, it is a, as big as Amerigo, which is another queen game in a big box. And so we finally just try out the base game the last day because the big box is the one that comes with all the expansions in it. So Alhambra is a tile laying game. Hurrah! I do have a penchant for those. Um, but you wanna you want a tile laying game that obviously does something a little bit different than others because you know there are a lot of really good tile laying games out there. Obviously Carcassonne, things like King Domino and Lanterns and stuff. So you want to really be stepping it up. And Alhambra is a Spill Desires winner. So it came with its own pedigree. And yeah, you, you place your tiles together um, and you try and build your city. The special thing about Alhambra is to do with the payment of things. So there is money, but money comes in particular colours. And so certain tiles are only placed on certain colours. You want to build your city as big as you can. You want to build as many unique buildings in it. You want to connect your wall around the edges, which turned out to be not as worth as many points as I had hoped. Um, but it was actually really, really fun. I, I liked it a lot. It was a nice twist on kind of the the normal tile lane games. Very chill, very calm. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the expansions add because there's a whole bunch of them in the box to get to. I don't even know where to start. Um, so yeah, so that is um, Alhambra. I must say, actually, there's a whole bunch of discrepancies between what's in the rule book for that and what you actually get on the table. Like it's a different color in the rule book and it's a different color um, in real life. 
To be fair, lignum had a similar issue. Lignum was going on about, you know, you have these green meeples you're supposed to place out in the board, but there's no green meeples in the box. They were just purple meeples. Um, and it's not a big deal, I suppose, but it's funny when it says one thing and then you see another. I don't know, I find it a little confusing sometimes, but um, yeah, the Alhambra one seems to be a little all over the place. And at least one of our expansions looks like it's in French. All the cards are in French and not in English. So I don't know how to deal with that, maybe at a later date. Um, so yeah, so that was the first trade. And then the second trade, um, which came through literally yesterday. So we got a copy of Hamburgum. I thought Hamburgum? <laughs> it's Hamburg with an extra um at the end. Um, and we traded away our copy of Vikings for this. So Vikings was um, the really cool roundel tile laying game um, where as Vikings you would build out particular rows of islands and score points for however you could build them in different rows. It's actually a very fine game to be fair. Um, just yet again one we just felt like we weren't going to play very often. So yeah it's a good game. And then so Hamburgum, God I'm bad at pronouncing this, Hamburgum. Yeah, I'll stick with that. <laughs> um, is a game from Mac Gertz. So you may know him from creating games like Concordia and Navigador. And um, obviously we love Concordia. I, I suppose there's nothing obvious about it. I'm not wearing my I love Concordia t-shirt, but I do love Concordia. Um, and it's one of our favorite games. So we wanted to get another game by the, you know, the same designer as you kind of do. And I would have got Navigador, only it's about colonialism and I'm not touching that with a 10 foot barge pole because it makes me kind of uncomfortable. So Hamburgum is a, is a game about building churches and getting resources to invest in the church. Yeah, I know. Um, it's got possibly the most boring looking cover ever. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the pilgrim looking guy on the cover. Um, but it's got a roundel mechanic. So I do love a roundel. So I played this yesterday for the first time and it took me a it took me a while to wrap my head around it. And I, I think that might have been to do with the teach because everything's kind of connected and you have to work your way backwards to see why you're doing any particular thing. So you want to invest in the churches because they give you kind of bonuses, but also you want to invest in the churches so you can build guild halls near your churches on the map. And you want guild halls so that when you make stuff, you make more stuff, but you only want the stuff to help you buy stuff to build the churches. Yeah with me yeah you see what I mean it was a bit like oh what's this all about um but <laughs> once we got going it kind of got there it made sense um some of it's a little bit obvious for my liking I think some of the actions are just too simple like one of the like there's there's a wheel obviously of things you can do um and the problem is with the goods in the game is that you can acquire goods from your guild houses but all they're good for is turning into other goods so and then that's a whole separate action of turning your goods into goods um it just i don't know i found it just a little bit slow um like i think there's something interesting to the game i you know um i don't think it's particularly terrible but i just found it like it was missing a little spark or something or it definitely felt its age it is an older game um but yeah i can see why people like it you do also get bells in it like a little bell that rings that goes tinkle tinkle um which i thought was pretty nice um the components are really quite good so it's it's interesting i just i don't know maybe it was just because it was our first game i might give it another go and see how we go um but it just felt like it miss, it was missing a bit of pizzazz or a bit of punch or you know that thing where you go aha you know it was just a bit obvious so um yes yeah, so that was my experiences with hamburgum um so yeah so that's everything new um, that came in that was traded for um i'd love to know how your collection is getting on at the moment um and yeah that's that so i'll move on to the next section where i'll talk about games i've been playing which i kind of have already been talking about if i'm honest hmm. all right so games i've been playing i definitely feel like i've been playing less games this month than other months um it's just been a kind of rough month overall and then it's just it's been hard to play games in the evenings um now i've been playing games at the weekends which is always awesome um but just yeah as a whole it's been difficult to kind of sit down and, and feel like playing things and i think we all go through those kinds of phases don't we um and i suppose it's a little bit tougher on me sometimes because i have to keep making things about board games and I have to keep talking about board games so i kind of have to keep playing board games if i want to keep that momentum going right um so 
yeah, see, this is the problem with having um, already played all of the games there for this month, actually, because as it stands, I have currently nothing on my shelf of shame. Um, and I really, I'll talk about uh, Matanai just because we're here, and it's the game that have been on my shelf of shame the longest. Um, and this is a very small card game. It comes in a very small box, and apparently it is kind of like the sequel to Glory to Rome, which is a card game I'd heard tons about, but had never played. Um, and I'd heard kind of okay things about this and yet again this was another one of those I spotted it on sale I think it was a tenner on Amazon and it took it three months to show up because it seemed to have come from the states as opposed to the UK site so took it forever and it got here we opened it up and went oh okay that's a lot of stuff to take in and left it so we finally got to it this weekend um, and so Matana is a game about not wasting um, and you are a group of monks who are trying to craft particular items. Um, this idea of not wasting I think is really reflected in the mechanic because the mechanics of the game are really you use everything and everything has multiple purposes um, which means it's, it's kind of hard to learn or to wrap your head around because you have a little sheet and there are four actions you can do on it but any one card you have in your hand can be used in any of those slots in in a variety of different ways um, and so it makes for a very weighty kind of card game but a very very interesting one there were kind of a lot of combos and things to be put together um, I still don't feel like I fully wrapped my head around it I was just trying to figure out exactly where I could put my cards and how that affected what I could do next um, and what kind of tasks I could do um, but it was really really interesting I definitely like to give it another go um, I don't know if other people have played it before I've, I've seen it mentioned a few times but not a lot um, but it's a very yeah it's a very weighty and interesting card game and if it's actually that cheap like normally yet again probably you know worth having a look at but yeah teaching it I think is tough just because everything has so many uses right those kind of games are like that so it was really good to get to it and to, to kind of move it off my shelf of shame because I don't know about you guys but I look at games I haven't played and I go but what if it's really good what if it's amazing what if I want to play this over and over again and I left it sitting on my shelf this entire time and I didn't know you know it's potential um so it was good to get Mata and I moved on so I'll put I'll put that in there as the game that was on my shelf the longest I finally finally got to now I wanted to kind of talk more about Lignum because I liked it so much but I, I think I kind of talked all I could about Lignum which is kind of sad but that was my plan this is the problem with having played all the games already because I've already told you about them so at least no element of surprise for this section um, what I will talk about actually is Crusaders and um, they will be done and this is from Tasty Minstrel Games and I think I picked this up right at the end of last month and as you may know I love Tasty Minstrel Games they, they generally are the kind of games that click well with us here um, and so I was there, there was two I really wanted to get for ages one of which was Scoville which I talked about last month I love Scoville it's great it made all it made it made its whole way into the collection and then Crusaders was the other um, that I wanted and so finally managed to snag a copy of that and um, so Crusaders is indeed a game about well crusading um, but what's interesting about this is that it's a mixture of kind of your own personal roundel to choose what type of actions you're going to do um, but area control because there's a board you're spreading out across and you're putting pieces out on um, your player board it might actually it's very like um Trajan if you've played that with the whole roundel thing where you're moving your little drowl pieces I it's not actually the name for those little cylinders I call them drowls I think that means the ones with the head like you know the pawns with the heads I don't know I'm, okay the cylinders um where you move them around to match them up with each other to perform an action um and I don't, you know, it, yeah, it, remind, it reminds me of Trash, and I think that's also noted by the game designer too. But the rest of your board is interesting because it reminds me of another game, which is Terra Mystica, where um, you take pieces off of your board um, to give you bonuses and better actions. So you're putting like little houses and stuff out on the board to control particular areas. Um, and it's got some really nice components. It's a really good looking game, um, including little men and horses and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's the kind of game that I should have fallen in love with right away. It's got all sorts of things I really like. Um, but instead, it just made me want to go and play Trashan, which is a terrible waste, really, because, you know, I, I don't know um, why it didn't just kind of excite me more. I, I think it should have. 
like you know what I mean do you ever read a game where like all of these things are the things I like and then you play it and you're like mm, not so sure um I just think maybe it's just a little um I said this earlier on today obvious maybe I don't know I think I'm not sure if my tastes in games are changing or I'm getting very snobby or I've just played a lot of games now so that I feel like I have a kind of a different opinion. Um, I like Crusaders, but not enough to keep it, um, which is interesting. Maybe I just, I, I want a slightly more challenging puzzle, I'm not sure, but it is a very, very good game um, and there's a lot of really fun parts to it. Um, so yeah, so that's that was Crusaders. So the final game I'm going to talk about is one that I've not played in a really long time and in the quest to play the games in our collection that I've only been played once um, we took ourselves out a copy of Foot Health. Um, so this is um, basically the card game version of Snowdonia from Tony Boydell. This comes from Lookout Games um, and it's a very small box. It's a two player only game about building railroads. Um, and we we got Foothills uh, at Spiel last year and when we played it we really really liked it actually from the get-go. It's got a very clever card flipping mechanism um, where when you perform an action um, it flips to the other side of the card so if you want that side back you have to perform the action on the other side and there's ways to upgrade these cards and make them slightly better all in the meantime while building railroad tracks and stations and getting victory points all kinds of fun stuff right. Um, so so it's, it's a really fun game when we first played it and we meant to get back to it you know you know that kind of way um it had, it had sat for a while but we weren't worried about it so we took it out last week because we were wondering if we would just you know keep foothills and a lubari um, a nice cup of tea instead of snowdonia because they're all rather similar um and we sat down to play it and it was like the longest game i'd ever played and it was only when we played like we were two and a half hours i think in for this two player little card game um that i remembered that it had been just as long to play the first time and i'd assumed it was because the first game you know takes a bit of time to play you know all that kind of stuff um but no that's not the case we just we couldn't get the game to end there's particular conditions you want to meet to make an end and so we looked it up online to see if anyone else had had this problem on board game geek and sure enough there was an entire thread about it and apparently you have to play the game in a particular way if you want it to end yeah like you you have to build railroad tracks even though they never seemed really worthwhile over building stations um and i thought that was a really interesting and also a very fatal flaw and um, i know last year i talked about foothills quite positively um but it's really funny to show that you know you need more plays of a game to really know it but i, I was really disappointed by that outcome to be honest i assumed we were doing something like mistakenly or there was an error no 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 it's just apparently the way the game runs so that's really um put a dampener on foothills for us um definitely moved it on to the trade pile after that so i don't know if anybody's played it have you had this issue um and would you play a game that had a, a flaw like that would you mind playing around it hmm, interesting stuff all right so that's the games bit um i'll very quickly move on to the final bit if you want to hear a little bit about the channel about me you know just me chatting stuff otherwise you can probably toddle off now and thank you for watching okay one sec let's go congratulations on making it to the final phase <laughs> oh i just had to say that um how has your month been going i i hope it's been good are things settling down a little bit with you in the midst of all this craziness or are we just adjusting to all the crazy um here it's been a really really tough month and it's not looking like it's going to get any better um and you know that's just how i am in the world that things are just generally difficult and i've been plodding along to get as much stuff done as i can as possible actually i'm quite happy with most of all of this but it's it's hard to know if you're doing the right thing or if what you're doing is good enough when it's just you and i can't can't really tr trust my own judgments of myself um especially when it comes to making videos and putting yourself out there in the world it's a it's a difficult thing for someone who's as, as insecure as me to do and and yet surprisingly enough i'm still here yeah i know i just i guess i think that um board games and sharing them with people is more important than my own problems um and in a way they help me a lot with my problems too um so i'm very th i'm very thankful for all of that but it's just leaves you in a bit of a funny place sometimes like 
I was saying it last week, I just, I really want to write a manifesto, like the board game inquisition manifesto of, you know, what I'm about, why I'm doing this, the kind of expectations I can have of myself and stuff, but I just don't have the energy to write it. Um, and it sounds like something I could really do with because it's very easy to lose sight of what you're trying to do in the midst of the world of kind of, you know, social media and, um, you know, in a world where, oh <laughs> how you feel for a day depends on how many likes you got or you know how many people said nice things or upvotes or downvotes it's very easy to get caught up in all that when you've got very little belief in yourself um and I'm very fortunate that I'm surrounded on the interwebs by all sorts of amazing people yourself included uh who are really kind and really forgiving and really generous with me um and I don't have all those kind of, I don't have a lot of those haters that a lot of other people maybe, you know, seem to do. And I'm very, very thankful because I think that would be really, really rough. That's really unfair for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm holding myself together and I'm trying to center myself as much as I can. Like the other interesting thing is that I'm running out of review copies. Um, and on the one hand, it might be nice not to have to review something for a bit and look at my own games and talk about those. But also there's something important for me of working for somebody else and doing a good job for them. Um, and that kind of push is there. And I think this is because, you know, more people are reviewing things online now. Um, so many games are going on to Tabletop Simulator and things like that. And people want their games to be reviewed that way instead of having to go to the effort or the time or the difficulties, I suppose, in posting out actual finished games or, or prototypes. Um, and I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I feel quite strongly that reviewing a game digitally has no connection to reviewing the game in real life. Um, and this comes out of the fact that, like, <laughs> I was working on a PhD in philosophy um, and what my PhD was actually about was the importance of face-to-face -face interaction um, in a digital world in a sense. And so I spent like four, four and a half years um, studying what it was, how, how important the face is, how important that interaction is and how easy it is to misinterpret each other when we're not in person. Um, and for me, when it comes to, to board games and things like that, this, this notion of reviewing a game without anyone else being there and speaking to what the game itself might be like in the real world is odd. And for me, like me personally, it would feel very disingenuous um, because that's not a real representation, I think, of that game. And there are a lot of people reviewing games online um, as, you know, online reviews. We're only talking about it online. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But for me, I would be very uncomfortable reviewing games in that way. And I think that's cut me out of a whole loop um, right now of things that I could be um, talking about or playing because I'm not, I'm not interacting with them digitally. Um, and that's a, it's just a funny place to be in. And I wonder now as kind of, as we kind of develop and live in the world of COVID, what that means for future board games, board game reviews, and how we play games with each other. This might be changing and maybe, you know, I'm falling behind the times. I'm not entirely sure, but um, I just, I know, I know as a person that, I don't know, I'd, I'd want someone to have played my game for real um, to inform me about it. Am I crazy? What, what, how do you guys feel about all of this actually? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's unusual. I think, I think circumstances are unusual right now. So people are coming up with fresh and innovative ways of exploring games and how they play. Um, and where it'll end up, who knows? I just know I'm sitting here stuck in the middle going, but it's not the same, at least, at least, at least to me anyway. So we'll have to see what happens um, and what I do next, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I'm in the process of just trying to get my crap together, I think is the best I can put it, put it, put it, yeah. Because uh, for me, life is tough um, and I, I know everybody has it hard sometimes, if not all of the time, but... I find everything I do is really, really difficult and I, I do my best to do as much of it as I can. And I'm trying very hard to hold all of that together and keep keep everything going. Because um, if I stop, I think I'm worse. <laughs> 
So I'm very thankful I have this outlet. I have people like you to listen to me and hopefully I'll have more games to bring you in the future. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, there's some real crackers coming soon. Me and my new tripod are going to go and see how kind of sexy we can make my intro videos. Let's find out. Um, but as always, I, I'd love your feedback. I hope you guys like the new setup um, where things are more yellowy. I'm trying to go for a particular look in my videos and sometimes I think it looks good and sometimes I think it looks really crap. So I'd love to know your opinions as well, what you think of where this is going and stuff like that. And hopefully I will be back soon with some, yeah, more videos and stuff. And thank you for watching guys. Wishing you a really, really good month. And I'm looking forward to hearing about all your games in the comment box below. All right, thanks for watching everybody. Take care, bye-bye.